Hi everyone. My name is Lenora Henson and I'm the Curator and Director of Public Programming here at the Theodore Roosevelt inaugural site. On behalf of our board, board of trustees and staff, I'd like to welcome all of you to speaker night. I'd especially like to welcome Judy Gear, who is our guest speaker this evening. Speaker night is our opportunity on the fourth Tuesday of most months to invite experts in to come in and help us think about some of the issues that were important during TR's presidency and continue to be relevant today. The TR site's Speaker Night series is made possible by the generous support of MNT Bank as well as the New York State Council on the Arts, or NISCA. So thank you very much to both of those groups. I should also mention that NISCA's support has enabled us to record all of our speakers, not only this year, but also last year. So if you've missed any of them, please uh, check out the recordings on our YouTube channel. As I already mentioned, we are joined this evening by Judy Gear, who will be looking at Theodore Roosevelt and his role as America's greenest president. Judy was an educator for 37 years before retiring as professor librarian from Erie Community College in 2005. She holds degrees from Keuka College, SUNY Geneseo, and SUNY Buffalo. During her tenure at ECC, she was awarded the SUNY Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Librarianship as well as the ECC President's Award for Student Advocacy. In 1994, she received a SUNY grant and organized a conference titled The Status of Women in Western New York. Judy is a member of the Delta Kappa Gamma Society and Honor Society of Women Educators, the Holland Fern Leaf Reading Club, and the Holland Garden Club. Judy's interests include reading, writing, gardening, politics, and hiking. She enjoys offering talks on a variety of subjects to groups all around Western New York and occasionally even farther afield. Having said that, I'm delighted to turn the podium over to Judy Gear. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you, Lenora. If anybody wants a tour of this place, Lenora is wonderful. She gave us a little tour this afternoon and it was great. And to stand in this rather hallowed spot uh, is very inspiring, believe me. Um, I want to welcome everybody here. Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, and everybody on YouTube, thank you for tuning in. Um, uh, first of all, how about the outfit? Green, green. ecology green. <laughs> petrified wood necklace in the petrified forest, which TR saved. Uh, Redwood earrings from Mirror Woods, which TR saved, so one tries. <laughs> uh, this talk is based on a book by Douglas Brinkley. You may see him on television. He is on frequently. He is a, a presidential historian, and his book, Wilderness Warrior, is a wonderful read, and he's talking about one aspect of Theodore Roosevelt's presidency, and look at the size of the book. And you wonder, uh, Theodore Roosevelt slept maybe four to six hours a night. This is why they can do one book this size on one aspect of his presidency. Uh, he was a go-getter from the word from the word go, actually. Uh, that book is. As I said, a terrific read. I uh, do not get commission for saying that, uh, but you can get that book at the public library. I'm a librarian. I looked it up before I came here. Uh, you can also get it on Amazon. Uh, and there is a copy downstairs in the bookstore, too, if you would like to, to purchase your own. Um, it may be a little slow reading because of its length and its precise detail. It really is quite excellent. So this is Theodore Roosevelt, America's greenest president. Several years ago, 12 leading environmental groups were asked by a media company to submit the names of the three U.S. presidents which they felt had done the most to preserve and protect the American environment. Depending on your knowledge of political and conservation history, you may or may not be surprised to learn that only eight of the 44 presidents in the survey were even mentioned, even got one vote, by any of the 12 groups surveyed. 
however, only a thimbleful of knowledge of 20th century American history is necessary for most Americans, at least in my generation and kind of around that, to name the president who is at the top of the heap among those eight. The one who stands out as a shining beacon of environmental enlightenment, and that president is, of course, Theodore Roosevelt. He was rated far above the other presidents on the list, and, and the other presidents are very interesting, as a matter of fact. You may be surprised at who some of the other ones are. Uh, I can mention that uh, later, but it's quite revealing. Theodore, uh, in this talk, I will endeavor to explain why this wealthy, privileged man beset with massive problems and projects in many arenas during his presidency, turned the country's attention, in good times and bad, toward the beauty and wonder of the topography, flora, and fauna of this vast and extraordinary land of ours. What influences were at play in his upbringing that inspired him to care so deeply about the natural world and what measures did this formidable man take to ensure that his love for nature and nature's creatures became incorporated into our nation's legal and governmental systems? Let's begin with a story to illustrate the determination he used when push came to shove in the protection of the natural world. In March of 1903, TR, as President Theodore was affectionately known during his tenure as president, don't call him Teddy, he didn't like that. TR took a meeting in the White House with two men, Frank Chapman, curator of ornithology and mammalogy at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, and William Dutcher, first president of the National Association of Audubon Societies. These men had been lobbying for years to create a bird sanctuary on a place called Pelican Island, a federally owned spot of land off the east coast of Florida, about halfway down, halfway down the boot. This rocky little isle in the Indian River was the nesting place for thousands of exotic birds many of which were then being hunted for their beautifully shaped and colored plumage, which milliners used at the time for decorations on ladies' hats. This White House meeting was brief but groundbreaking for the American conservation movement. Although an avid hunter all his life, T.R. had always been sickened by wanton cruelty to animals. Therefore, he was an eager audience of one as these two men pled their case. This is how historian Douglas Brinkley describes what happened that day. After listening attentively to Chapman's and Dutcher's description of Pelican Island's quandary, and sickened by the update on the plumer's slaughter for millinery ornaments, Roosevelt asked, is there any law that will prevent me from declaring Pelican Island a federal bird sanctuary? The answer was a decided no. The island, after all, was federal property. Very well then, Roosevelt said with marvelous quickness, I so declare it. <laughs> For the first time in history, the U.S. government had set aside hallowed, timeless land for what became the first unit of the present U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's National Refuge System. On March 14th of that year, Pelican Island was officially so designated by a brief 50-word presidential executive order. The island remains protected to this day. Boat tours around it are available from Sebastian, Florida, but the island itself is off limits to tourists. It became then 
and is now literally for the birds. <laughs> My husband and I have taken that boat ride, and it is absolutely amazing at twilight to see thousands of different kinds of beautiful birds flocking in. This episode, however, was not the first time Theodore Roosevelt was moved to show his deeply felt homage to nature, nor would it be his last by a long shot. We must remember that his love of nature didn't just manifest itself on that March 1903 afternoon when he declared Pelican Island a bird sanctuary. It had been growing in him like rising bread since he was a small boy and continued to expand in him until his dying day. Now before we continue the discussion of TR's gifts to the preservation of our nation's natural bounty, I really must talk a little bit about who this big fellow was. His vibrant personality was tied securely to his seemingly endless accomplishments both as a private citizen and as a president. To say he was a man of action was to put it very mildly indeed. Journalist William Allen White wrote of him, there was no twilight and evening star for him. He plunged headlong snorting into the breakers of the tide that swept him to another born. Full armed, breasting the waves, a strong swimmer undaunted. A less romantic description was offered by his sharp-tongued elder daughter, Alice Roosevelt, who once said that her father was the corpse at every funeral, the bride at every wedding, and the baby at every christening. He didn't want to get on the wrong side of Alice. In other words, where Ever he was, he commanded the space around him. Belying the assumption by many that he was a giant in physical size, in adulthood he stood only five foot eight, but he weighed 200 pounds. However, coupled with his irrepressibly exuberant personality and with his large head and heavily muscled body, he looked monumental. T.R. was the second child and elder son of the four children of Theodore Sr. and Martha, or Mitty, Roosevelt. This future president was born in 1858 in the Roosevelt family home at 28 East 20th Street in New York City. The Roosevelts were quite wealthy and their children could have ended up living pleasant, uncomplicated lives in the lap of luxury. <coughs> But this was not what happened. So what did go on in the early life of the boy T.R. that imbued in him an ideal of public service and a love of nature and nature's creatures that was so strong that it took just a short chat with two naturalists on that fateful 1903 day in the White House to convince him that wilderness was worth protecting from human manipulation on that little island off the coast of Florida. Well, it started with his dad. Now, a lot of us think our dads were pretty special, and T.R. felt the same about his. By all accounts, his father, Theodore Sr., was a loving family man and an all-round wonderfully kind and generous human being. In fact, Theodore Sr.'s sister-in-law coined a nickname for him, Greatheart, after the character in the Pilgrim's Progress who was a fearless leader and protector of the vulnerable. An abolitionist before the Civil War, Theodore Sr. held a firm belief that the government should intervene to help the poor and disenfranchised. But he also felt that as a private citizen with great wealth, he was obliged to do his own intervening to help the poor. He founded the New York Orthopedic Hospital, as well as the Newsboys Lodging House 
on West 18th Street, where he would go at least once a week to regale the abandoned and orphaned boys who sold newspapers on city streets with stories and advice and food. And frequently he would take his four children with him so they could see there were children not like them, children they needed to help. But the most important lesson for his son, the future naturalist president, was the fact that his father's interest in the study of the natural sciences contributed to Theodore Sr. becoming a primary founder of the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. In fact, the charter for that esteemed institution was written and signed in the front parlor of the Roosevelt home on East 20th Street in 1869. The family support of the museum lasted several generations, and now in that museum you will see the Roosevelt Room, and there's all kinds of, of uh, animal heads and things like that that are on the wall that the Roosevelts uh, donated to the museum. Their financial contribution was extraordinary. At the time the museum was founded, TR was 10 years old a bright, precocious boy who loved reading about and observing animal life. He drew pictures of insects, birds, and small mammals, and he took up taxidermy as a hobby, often exuding formaldehyde from his little self to the point where his family did not want to be around. <laughs> One day, his mother found he'd been storing dead mice in the icebox, and she ordered that they be thrown in the garbage. He despaired over the loss to science. <laughs> he was 11 at the time. Although always seeming to the American public to be a very robust person while he was president, T.R. had actually been a very sickly boy who suffered from asthma and weakened lungs to the point that he almost died a few times when he was a child. And his father was glad he'd taken up the study of nature, which meant that he would be spending a lot of time outdoors in the fresh air observing the wild flora and fauna. For the rest of his life, T.R. was such an ardent naturalist that it was almost like a second job for him, even in the White House. Whenever the family traveled, which they did with some frequency, to the Adirondacks, Europe, or along the Nile in Egypt, young T.R. would shoot and stuff birds and other small animals. And upon his return to New York, he would gift many of these specimens. Many of them were exotic specimens. And he would gift them to the museum his father had been instrumental in founding. Many of these animals can still be found there today. And even when he was big game hunting in Africa and South America and out west, he would gift many of those as well. Besides his dad, another family member who furthered T.R.'s naturalist bent was his father's brother, T.R.'s uncle Robert Barnwell Roosevelt, who lived near Theodore Sr.'s home in New York City. Although Robert Roosevelt had written a definitive resource on bird life in 1884 called Florida and the Game Water Birds of the Atlantic Coast and the Lakes of the United States. I don't know how they got their title on the book, but they did. Actually, Robert's uh, real first interest was in fish. In 1862, Robert wrote a tract entitled Game Fish of the Northern States of America and British Provinces. And despite the academic sounding title, it was a sensational hit with the public when it was published and is even praised today as the mid-19th century equivalent of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Robert also had a house full of pet animals. Chickens, parrots, guinea pigs, a spider monkey. This is in New York City, so picture this. Uh, and once even a cow and horse in his parlor. His nieces and nephews found all this very exciting 
and it engendered in them great respect for animal life. It also transferred to the next generations. Some of you may have heard stories of TR's children in the White House and the animals, they, they had a one-legged rooster in there, in the White House, a parrot, huge parrot, um, guinea pigs, the usual cats and dogs, um, and one notorious episode uh, where uh, little Archie, the uh, second from the youngest child, was sick upstairs, and his brothers thought it would be very amusing and cheer him up if only they could bring Algonquin the pony upstairs in the White House to see Archie, and they did. They stuffed the pony in the White House elevator and took it up. And I don't know if they went along behind him with a shovel, but but Archie was up there, and, and Algonquin. Um, biographer Douglas Brinkley goes so far as to say that Uncle Robert Roosevelt, more than any other direct influence, turned Theodore Jr. into a conservationist as a teenager. Brinkley concludes that the future president was a hybrid, half his father, the other half, Uncle Rob. <laughs> In 1876, T.R. began his studies at Harvard. Ironically, although T.R. studied natural sciences at Harvard, he never did go into it as a career, something he seriously considered when he began his studies there. Harvard was one of the few places of higher education in the country at that time that even offered courses in natural sciences. That's why he went there. Um, but he decided that, he, that this was not the life for him, even though his interest remained piqued. After receiving his BA in 1880, magna cum laude with a Phi Beta Kappa key, I might uh, add, he elected to go into politics. How different our country would be if he had become a scientist rather than a politician. I think that despite his great interest in natural science, his vibrant, expansive personality just could not be contained within the intense laboratory work required for the scholarly scientific life he had thought just a few years before that he had wanted, and he was wise enough to know it. His passion for nature, though, stayed with him and led up to that 1903 declaration of Pelican Island as a bird sanctuary, and oh, so much more. On the afternoon of September 6, 1901, our man T.R., who after stints as a New York State Assemblyman and as State Governor, had become President of the United States earlier in 1901, was attending a luncheon of the Vermont Fish and Game League at Ile Lamont in Lake Champlain. After lunch, while entertaining the members with stories of his big game hunting expeditions in the western U.S., he received a phone call telling him that President William McKinley had been shot at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo. Thus began the start of the presidency just a few days later of T.R., our foremost conservationist president, a man for whom Arbor Day was as big a holiday as the 4th of July. No kidding. <laughs> Shortly after taking the presidential oath of office on September 17th, 14th, right here in this building, as we know. T.R. let it be known that he would gear up to fight to protect America's heritage. The heritage he referred to were the wild areas, especially out west, with which he had been intimately acquainted for many years. He had hunted and studied the plant and animal life there for decades. And he'd even taken refuge on a farm, which he purchased in the hinterlands of North Dakota, after the deaths on the same day of his wife and mother in 1884. Uh, his grief was enormous. A few months after that horrible day, 
He left the New York State Assembly, to which he had been elected some time before, and moved to the, a remote farm in North Dakota. Years passed before he returned to take up his political life again, and by that time he was ready and able to put the full force of his knowledge and political acumen behind the burgeoning New York State and U.S. environmental movements. There's no time in this talk to include the vast number of machinations T.R. went through in his time as governor of New York and just over seven years as president to preserve the parks, forests, and animal refuges he did. But I'll mention some of them, and you may be surprised to know what they are. First, let's remember just what was happening in the U.S. conservation movement at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries, when T.R. was active nationally on the political stage. Henry David Thoreau had published Walden, his treatise on living alone in the woods, in 1854, and the reading public was captivated by his unabashed love of nature. Charles Darwin's Origin of the Species was published in 1859, the year after T.R.'s birth. And T.R. was such a fan of this controversial scientific theory that as an adult, he frequently carried a copy of it with him. These books, taken seriously by U.S. institutions of higher education by the late 1800s, when T.R. was in school, influenced the young men who attended them, many of whom eventually became the leaders of our country. It is not surprising, therefore, that the Interior Department was, by 1890, closing off large swaths of the West to future development and that by 1898, 40 million acres had been saved as reserves. Yellowstone National Park, the first national park in the world, had been so designated in 1872, and a few others followed in short order. With almost priest-like devotion, people like naturalist John Muir and John Burroughs and foresters like Gifford Pinchot and the many directors of nature societies and museums fought to make the wilderness areas in the country known and beloved by ordinary Americans whom they attempted to inspire to preserve these spots before they were irretrievably ruined. But the staunchest and certainly the most powerful advocate of our nation's wild canyons, mountains, lakes, deserts, and animals was our 26th president, Theodore Roosevelt. He didn't start the environmental movement, nor did he start the national park system, but he was a mighty link on the continuum of all the efforts which eventually gave us so many of our national parks, forests, and seashores, and saved so many of our wild animals from extinction. To tell the truth, T.R. did so much for our country's nat uh, natural resources, both as a private citizen and a politician, that I hardly know where to begin in relating them. But surely his most outstanding conservationist legacy is the Antiquities Act. In the middle of President Roosevelt's second term in office, he'd been elected in his own right in 1904. He had become frustrated at the slowness with which Congress was tackling efforts to preserve areas of historical and geological interest in the West, areas which corporations and individuals were destroying for their own profit and from which they were poaching relics. Remember that most of what we now know uh, as out West were territories in 1906, not states. So the federal government controlled them. They didn't have a state government uh, to be concerned with. Roosevelt needed a law that would give him the authority to bar the poachers, called pot hunters, 
and the corporate entities which wanted to use federal land for grazing or for the extraction of ore, timber, and oil from places near and within what are now national parks, like the Grand Canyon, the Petrified Forest, and Mesa Verde, among many others. On June 6, 1906, President Roosevelt signed into law an act for the preservation of American antiquities, known today as the Antiquities Act of 1906. The law sounded innocuous enough. It allowed for the president to designate historical landmarks, historic preservation structures, and other objects of scientific interest as national monuments. And it sailed through both houses of Congress. He had the support of an important congressman from Illinois, Congressman Lacey, uh, who cared as much about the environment as TR did, but he didn't have the, the wherewithal. He didn't have the bully pulpit that TR did. So between the two of them, they pushed it through Congress and it, it went through like a warm knife through butter. But in the hands of a president, such as Theodore Roosevelt, a master of political strategy and a highly focused lover of nature, this one act gave him the opportunity to declare an inordinate amount of land as protected territory under its aegis. He still needed congressional approval for national park status, but with the Antiquities Act, all he needed to declare a spot a national monument and thus protect its relics and or living matter was, in the words of Douglas Brinkley, determination. And that T.R. had in huge measure. From then on, Brinkley states, it would be up to the federal government, not big business, to lease lands for logging or mining. Throughout the West, the prettiest scenery not deforested or contaminated would be on the table for consideration as national parks or forest reserves. Not on TR's watch would such lovely Pacific Northwest ranges <coughs> as the Cascades and Olympics be turned into heaping mounds of slag, <coughs> as in Appalachia. TR used the Antiquities Act over and over the last two and a half years he was in office, most prominently to declare 800,000 acres in Arizona as the Grand Canyon National Monument. It did not receive park status until 1919, after his death. He may have overstepped the true intent of the Antiquities Act by so doing, but this area was never again given over to private hands, at least not yet. Of course, the lasting effect of the Antiquities Act is that presidents since TR have used it as well. Most recently, President Obama to preserve the Bears Ears area in Utah in late 2016. The Antiquities Act remains controversial to this day. In fact, the current federal administration issued an executive order in spring of 2017 directing that its intent be reviewed. The law gives great latitude to the president alone without approval of Congress to protect federal lands, which may seem to some Americans as undemocratic. But T.R. was surely aware of what had happened to places like the Petrified Forest, where pot hunters were making off with huge chunks of the beautifully formed and colored petrified wood. And in Mesa Verde, where a Swedish-Finnish scholar of Native American history had carted away a great number of Native relics and shipped them to Scandinavia in the early 1890s. Because there were no laws preventing pot hunters from looting these sites at that time, the scholar to whom I just referred shipped his hall of relics to Finland 
where today they still reside in the National Museum in Helsinki. TR knew he needed a legal means to use for immediate action to save land endangered animals or artifacts in case their preservation was in question and he couldn't wait for congressional action. Take the Grand Canyon, for instance. By 1908, mining and grazing interests were taking over more and more of the canyon's area, and TR had little sympathy for them. It was his belief that this magnificent area belonged to all Americans, not just to local Arizonans who used it for their own commerce. Although former President Benjamin Harrison had declared it a forest preserve, nothing could stop private development there. Congress dragged its feet in creating a Grand Canyon National Park, so TR took action. On January 11, 1908, he designated all 800,000 of its mineral-rich acres as a national monument. He was aware that it was understood by himself and Congress when the Antiquities Act was passed that the law was meant to cover the preservation of only 5,000 acres. But he also understood, since the acreage limitation was not directly stated in the Act, that the word understood gave him a lot of wiggle room to, shall we say, improvise. As Douglas Brinkley says, Roosevelt's characteristic impatience had made it difficult for him to abide by the old rules and wait for legislators to see the light. He would just declare something and let the chips fall where they may. And if Congress and Arizonan lawyers were confused about the Grand Canyon's irreplaceable aesthetic value, he would make them see it. His job as president was to procure the most happiness for the most people. That enters into his thinking now. He wanted people to be happy. The Grand Canyon was a truth for all time, not to be denied to future generations, a holy spot. The Grand Canyon was finally given national park status by Congress, as I said, in 1919, one month after T.R.'s death. It became one of the primary jewels in the crown of our national park system. And in 1979, it was named a World Heritage Site by the United Nations. It would have pleased T.R. that in 1990, the area in the park between Bright Angel Point and Cape Royal was renamed Roosevelt Point to honor him, the savior of this unspeakably gorgeous piece of real estate. Of the Grand Canyon, T.R. said, leave it as it is. The ages have been at work on it and man can only mar it. I'm going to mention one other of TR's conservation projects just because I think it's really interesting. The restoration of the wild buffalo to the Wichita Game Preserve in Oklahoma. The first national game preserve in the country. The buffalo herds, once so plentiful in the Great Plains, had been hunted almost to extinction. Everywhere in the early 20th century in North America. Except for little herds on private lands, a few head at Yellowstone National Park, like 12, 12 buffalo. If any of you have been to Yellowstone and seen the buffalo all over the place there, they are given a uh, deference. There were 12 scraggly looking buffalo left at this time in Yellowstone. And there was a small herd at the Bronx Zoo. Before we go any further with this tale, let me interject an aside here about the Bronx Zoo. 
officially known today as the New York Zoological Society. Plans to open this facility began in 1894 by, guess who? Yes, Theodore Roosevelt, the future president. In conjunction with his colleagues in the Boone and Crockett Club, named after Daniel Boone and David Crockett, a group which organized as a hunting club in the late 1800s then became a lobbying society for conservation legislation, and they were good lobbyists too. TR's underlying idea in promoting the creation of the zoo in the Bronx was to breed wild buffalo in captivity and then send them out to repopulate their native western habitats, which had by then been decimated of this largest extent land mammal in North America. The Bronx Zoo opened in 1898, right after T.R. had returned from his stint in Cuba as part of the Spanish-American War. Because he was one of the founders of the zoo, his idea for raising buffalo dinner was incorporated into the institution's mission. William Temple Hornaday, a prominent mammalogist, was appointed director of the zoo. He and Roosevelt had a long-standing connection because of their common interest in preserving endangered species. It's hard to believe now, but only about 1,100 bison were left in the entire country by the time President Roosevelt carried out his plan to restore this giant beast to some federally protected areas. On October 11, 1907, 15 buffalo, their breeding program had finally succeeded at the Bronx Zoo, and they were uh, having baby buffalo, and they uh, were doing this for the purpose of sending them back. They got the original herd from out west, and they're sending them back, their descendants back out west to repopulate. They sent 15 buffalo from the Bronx Zoo. They were loaded onto a train at Fordham Station in New York, bound for Oklahoma's Wichita National Forest. They arrived at their destination one week later after traveling in luxury boxcars. These were, after all, Mr. Roosevelt's buffalo. And the descendants of those original 15 bison roam what is now called the Wichita Game Preserve to this day. Buffalo from the Bronx Zoo also went to a preserve in North Dakota. They also went to Yellowstone to bolster those scraggly 12 that were there. So if you are in any of these place, places and meet a buffalo out there and they give you a Bronx cheer, you will know that it comes to them in their DNA. There are so many stories about T.R., like the great Mississippi bear hunt of 1903, when his refusal to shoot an injured and tethered bear so appealed to public sentiment that a Brooklyn seamstress fashioned a stuffed bear in his honor. A German seamstress did the same, and thus the teddy bear was born. By the way, both toy makers formed companies on the strength of their creations and made small fortunes in so doing. And the German lady was named Frau Stief. So if you have a Stief bear, which is still sold today, that's where it comes from. That's one of the original teddy bears. Then there was his trip to Yosemite in the early months of 1903, where he and John Muir spent three days together in the backcountry, camping under the stars and discussing the future ownership of that lusciously gorgeous bear. You can imagine presidents later in the 20th century or now going off with a friend for three days, alone, no cameramen, no secret service, nothing to camp under the stars. But uh, uh, he and Muir had enormous regard for each other, and their common scientific interests inspired the president to ensure 
that the Yosemite would finally end up in federal hands. It is one of the most beautiful places I have ever seen anywhere. Lying out at night under the giant sequoias had been like lying in a temple built by no hand of man, Roosevelt wrote after this trip. I hope for the preservation of the groves of giant trees simply because it would be a shame to our civilization to let them disappear. We are not, and, and he concluded, we are not building this country of ours for a day. It is to last through the ages. Theodore Roosevelt was not without his faults. He was certainly hypocritical when it came to his big game hunting, sometimes going after a species which was close to extinction just to put its head on his wall. When on that camping trip in California in 1903, John Muir mildly chastised him for doing that. He called him childish. T.R. agreed with him, but he couldn't stop hunting. T.R. hated corporate greed, which he saw as befouling the beauty of the natural world. But he failed to see that the rivers he was damming in the West drowned some of that natural beauty as well. But remarkably, during his tenure as president, Theodore Roosevelt created or enlarged 150 national forests created 51 bird reservations, including the first one ever, the aforementioned Pelican Island, Florida, created four national game preserves, including the first one ever at Wichita Forest in Oklahoma, submitted legislation to successfully designate five national parks, including um, Mesa Verde, and using the Antiquities Act, for which he was also responsible, he created 18 national monuments, including the first one ever, Devil's Tower in Wyoming. In all, TR saved more than 234 million acres of American wilderness in the name of the people of the United States personally visiting most of the areas before and during his presidency. Not surprisingly, T.R.'s desire to engage with nature didn't end after his time as president was over. Right after leaving the White House, he went on a year-long safari in Africa. Then he traveled down the unexplored River of Doubt, now called Roosevelt River in Brazil a journey which almost killed him, uh, literally. Um, and there's a wonderful book called River of Doubt written about that trip. It's, it, I know it was on PBS recently, but the book is even better. So if you get a chance, and it's not quite as big as Mr. Brinkley's book, <laughs> so it might be a, a little more appealing to read, but uh, he continued to speak out for the preservation of nature and to worry that the nation was ill-using instead of protecting its natural heritage resources. In a statement displaying the prescience which the accumulated knowledge of these matters gave to him, he said the following, We are still in that low state of civilization where we do not understand that it is also vandalism wantonly to destroy or to permit the destruction of what is beautiful in nature. Whether it be a cliff, a forest, or a species of mammal or bird. Here in the United States, we turn our rivers and streams into sewers and dumping grounds. We pollute the air, we destroy forests, and exterminate fishes, birds, and mammals. The statement was made by T.R. in 1913, over 100 years ago, but it sounds like it came out of a modern-day track by just about any current environmental society. Douglas Brinkley very crisply sums up Theodore Roosevelt's 
lifetime with nature, and I will leave you with that. He says, even as his sunlight dimmed, he held firm to his visionary stances on wildlife protection and sustainable land management. He saw the planet as one single biological organism, pulsing with life, and champion the interconnectedness of nature. His stout resoluteness to protect our environment is a strong reminder of our national wilderness heritage, as well as an increasingly urgent call to arms. Thank you. Thank you.